No matter what your stance is on your champions, there's one thing Riot has succeeded in. They're used quite often. Thanks to their modern and occasionally overloaded kits, champions like Vex, Zeri, Akshan, Viego, Samira, Yana, Belveth, and Gasante have persisted throughout solo queue for better or worse. But there are a few who may have had a strong first impression but would quickly fall off the face of the earth. Rel's story was by far the most high profile instance of this to happen, although she has been doing a lot better in recent months after her gameplay update. One champion who's currently following a similar downward trajectory is Madame Glask, a most unique support with a curious mixture of tactical offense and defense that you wouldn't find in any other member of the controller class. Initially, I had the assumption that due to her more novel take on supporting and very high playmaking potential, that she would be a staple presence in bot lane for years to come, but as you can see by her popularity history, she fell off tremendously. One could postulate that her situational utility inherently renders her niche, and therefore she won't have a big following to begin with compared to a more all-purpose controller like Thresh, which is true to an extent. But I think there's more to it than that. So in today's episode of Why No One Plays, we'll be discussing what happened to Renata Glass that made players discard her in such a short time. But before we do, I have a huge announcement to make for everyone. I'm sure most of you know this by now, but my second channel, Vars2, is known for making content on gacha games, primarily Genshin Impact and Honkai Star Rail right now. And incidentally, today's the day they're releasing Honkai Star Rail on the PlayStation Store for the PS5, coinciding with its version 1.4 update. For those who don't know what the game is about, Honkai Star Rail is a free-to-play cross-platform turn-based RPG made by Hoyoverse, the same creator that made Genshin Impact, that can be played on mobile, PC, and now finally PlayStation with a very easy-to-understand combat system based around elements and class types. For version 1.4, they're releasing two new characters, first being Ting Liu, and then later in the month Topaz and Numbi. Ting Liu has been one of the most anticipated characters for HSR ever since I made an animated short featuring her, and I actually made a video of my own on her if you want to check it out on Vars 2. She's a nice element DPS character who focuses on training her own team's health to enhance her own damage. As for Topaz and Numbi, they're also a damage dealer but for the fire element, prioritizing single target DPS through tag team system. Based on research I've done on my own, both of these units have the potential to be really strong in the meta. Alongside the two new characters is an expansion to one of Star Rail's worlds, Yurilo 6, after they just finished with the main story quest for it, and they're also featuring the first rerun banner for Sila who came out back in version 1. Plus, as a side event, they have the Aetherium Wars, where you can grab your favorite monster and fight other monsters with it. To celebrate this occasion, you'll get 10 free pulls across 7 days, and as an added bonus, they were nice enough to give me two redemption codes for you to use. The top one can be used during Jin Leo's banner period from October 11th to the 26th, and the bottom one works for Topaz and Numbi's banner period from October 27th to November 14th. I can personally vouch for Honkai Star Rail, I play it a lot, and I make videos on it on Vars 2, so feel free to try it out and take advantage of the new characters coming out to jumpstart your gameplay. Of course, I encourage you to check out my videos on them for extra info on Vars 2. Really cool to have a Honkai Star Rail sponsor on the main channel, but anyways, let's not waste any more time and talk about Renata. Renata's design makes her neither exclusively an enchanter or a catcher in my opinion. To be honest, I would call her a specialist, attributing to how unconventional her abilities are. When I made my first impressions episode on her, I was extremely nervous about her ability to cheat death, and jumped to the conclusion that it was just 200 years striking again. But with about a year and a half's worth of empirical data, my fears were allayed, a little too much. Much of, if not the entire reason behind Renata's decline has to do with player experience, and that's because anything and everything in her kit is conditional, obviously raising questions of consistency, in her case, way more than people are comfortable with. First ability, Leverage. Basic attacks deal bonus max health damage against the target, which then applies the mark on them. If an ally champion damages a marked enemy, they take the same damage again. Renata can then reapply the mark to repeat the cycle over and over again. Leverage is by no means an inventive passive. There's a champion that came out before and after her with a similar idea. Leona's passive Sunlight does almost the exact same thing, marking enemies with their abilities to where allies can set it off for some extra magic damage. The only difference is that Leona's is base damage while Renata's is percent health. Most people would assume Leverage is vastly more effective than Sunlight by virtue of dealing max health damage, but what makes Leona's more consistent is that she applies a passive through abilities, allowing multiple targets to be affected simultaneously off one use of Eclipse or Solar Flare, while Renata has only her basic attacks to work with. Milio's Fired Up is not too far off either. Anytime he buffs or heals himself or a target ally, their next basic attack or ability deals bonus magic damage over time, giving the potential for crazy DPS if coordinated even a little. Being an enchanter, Renata lacks the means to rapidly apply leverage onto multiple targets, essentially forcing her and whoever she's supporting to be on the same page in terms of who to attack, instead of just shooting anything that moves. Therein lies the condition, making a seemingly superior passive turn not inferior. Second ability, Handshake. A hook ability, not the first of its kind, and won't be the last either. It has the potential to be way more effective than any other hook in the game, but is also offset by an equal potential to be worse. Upon being thrown, it damages the first enemy hit and roots them for one second, granting true sight to them. During this time, Renata can recast the ability to forcibly push them in a certain direction. Towards her, away from her, left, right, wherever you want. 
If she knocks him towards another enemy champion, that enemy champion is stunned for half a second. This makes Handshake the only hook in the game that can crowd control two enemies per cast. Credit where credit is due, the flexibility in how you can push them can be game changing if used correctly. It can be used for engage, disengage, repositioning, or for general disruption. The number of use cases for Q is without question the most of its kind. However, I and probably some of you consider this the least effective hook in the game. The thing about hook supports like Blitzcrank, Nautilus, Thresh, and Pike is that there's a singular job all of them are supposed to do, isolate an out of place enemy champion. To make the most out of a successful hook, these champions have follow-up abilities that continue to restrain the victim they just caught out. Blitzcrank is Power Fist, Nautilus is Passive and Ultimate, Thresh is Flay and Box, Pike is Phantom Undertow. It's not so much the hook that most champions are afraid of, at least not entirely, it's what comes after. Handshake, just like Leverage, may appear to be better thanks to having a follow-up stun built into it, but it relies on another enemy champion being nearby for this to take place. Down in bot lane, that's not a big issue while with it being in 2v2 lane, but she doesn't have as heavy of a follow-up as other hook champions. So yes, while Handshake has a lot of use cases, it doesn't have the same immediate value as other hook type abilities, or even other enchanted crowd control abilities. Janna's Howling Gale would be considered more useful than Handshake for most people. It's just too conditional that on average it does less than what similar abilities and by extension champions can do. Third ability, Bailout. The one that I thought would make her overpowered is actually the ability that holds her back more often than not. On paper, Renata's W is busted, a sizable amount of bonus attack and movement speed that ramps up over the course of 5 seconds. If the target scores a takedown on an enemy champion, the duration of bailout resets, allowing you to theoretically have it up for as long as half a minute. In addition, should the buffed allies suffer fatal damage, they enter a zombie state that keeps them alive for a few seconds more. If they score a takedown during this time, the champion will survive with 20% of their health intact, allowing you to quite literally cheat death. The apparent condition is, of course, if you can score a takedown against an enemy champion in the few seconds you're in this state for. For Handshake, we compared its effectiveness to other engaged supports, and in my humble opinion, I believe it's just inferior to what the other hooks can accomplish on average. For Bailout, let's compare this to other enchanted buff type abilities. One that should immediately come to mind is Lulu's Whimsy, which also grants bonus attack and movement speed. Another one is Yumi, whose zoomies give a shield, bonus movement, and bonus attack speed. Right away, you may have noticed the sheer disparity in cooldowns. Renata's bailout at rank 1 is a whopping 28 seconds with a base duration of 5. That's a very long cooldown to have on a buff type ability, understandably so. The extension condition allows you to have that buff for a lot longer than the buffs Yumi and Lulu can give. But that's once again, if you can meet that condition. The point of buffs, especially those of enchanters, is to be consistent boosts in power. That's the whole point of the class. Having a conditional power boost defeats the purpose of an enchanter's buff type ability. You can't take the possibility of bailout lasting 30 seconds into account because it doesn't happen every time. As such, you can only gauge the base duration of 5. Furthermore, a longer duration doesn't compensate for a long cooldown. Yumi and Lulu's buffs last only 3 seconds at rank 1 but are accompanied by a much shorter cooldown. Why this is better is that it lets them switch who they're trying to buff. One second the Lulu might use Whimsy on her Trinomir top, the next one will be used on her Silas mid. It lets her quickly switch to whoever needs it the most. Meanwhile, Renata has to fully commit to one person. If you were going to play specifically for one person, you might as well play Yumi. Once more, the conditionality of this ability gets in the way of its practicality, making it feel like a worse ability than others of its kind, despite technically having way more potential impact. Fourth ability, Loyalty Program. Firing a projectile out in a straight line, it damages and slows all enemies while shielding all allies. The obvious implication is to try to strike as many allies and enemies at the same time for the most total shielding and damage, but to repeat, you can't reliably assume you'll hit more than one or two people on most at average. Nami's Zep and Flow is a similar conditional offense and defense to Loyalty Program, but with a few key distinctions. Instead of shielding, it heals, making it way more effective and neutral since healing is permanent. Also, it's an auto-targeting ability, bouncing between unaffected champions alternating between friends and baddies for a maximum of 3 bounces. Loyalty Program can affect all 10 champions in a single cast, giving it a far higher impact ceiling than Ebb and Flow. But it's still worse than Ebb and Flow simply because how often will all 10 champions be in a single file line for you to throw it through? Ebb and Flow, on the other hand, doesn't have to be aimed. It targets automatically. And finally, the fifth ability, Hostile Takeover. Unlike other giant wave ultimates you see on other sports, Hostile Takeover is an infinite value ability. There's no limit to how much value you can extract from a single use of it. However, in most cases, it doesn't do nearly as much as other wave ultimates. Crescendo, Final Chapter, Encore, Tidal Wave, Nature's Grasp, what makes them so valuable in teamfights is that there is a guaranteed value to them. You know, assuming they land. Song's Crescendo is a long stun, Final Chapter's damage and pressure, and it used to have a root on top of that before it got taken out, Tidal Wave is a knockup and a long slow after, Encore is a huge long distance charm, Nature's Grasp is a very wide zone controlling ability. 
In her defense, hostile takeover does have guaranteed value. It goes a very far distance and covers a significantly wider area than most of the wave ultimates, at the cost of traveling slowly. In some cases though, being a slow moving projectile is a good thing, it makes it very good for zoning just like Maokai's ultimate. The Berserk effect also qualifies as hard CC as it cancels channels, and having the enemy team auto attacking each other can give you a ton of free damage, especially if they have a ton of AD chance. The thing is, hostile takeover travels so slowly that you can only use it as a zoning tool, not engage. Plus, even though it is crowd control, Berserk is hard to accurately value in light of how erratically it makes champions behave, and it doesn't exactly make them less threatening. If you use or not assault on someone, and it's just you and them with no other targetable entities nearby, all you're doing is making them stronger against you. It's not like Seraphine's charm, which brings enemies closer to you, tightly packed together, and completely harmless. One more thing, Hostile Takeover doesn't do any damage, so in theory, Renata's ultimate can outclass any other wave ultimate, or it can offer the least contribution to a team fight, or in some cases, actively hurt you. Having gone through her entire kit, each ability from her passive to her basics to her ultimate has conditions behind their power, which can make them either really damn good or really damn bad. Power fluctuation is by no means intrinsically a negative thing, but there needs to be a degree of certainty to produce at minimum a desirable outcome, and Renata's abilities don't do enough of that. True, there's guaranteed value. Leverage is guaranteed to apply some extra damage over the course of a fight. Handshake is guaranteed to at least give you a 1 second route. Bailout is guaranteed to give you attack and movement speed. Loyalty program is guaranteed to shield, so on and so forth. When weighed against other members of either the Enchanter or Catcher subclasses, however, the baseline output on Renata is lower than her peers, with not enough consistency for the upside to make up that difference. As a parallel, let's compare Thresh's Death Sentence to Bliss's Rocket Grab. Both hooks have a stun duration of at least 1 second. Blitz Q yanks the target all the way to his current location, while Thresh Q drags him a short distance towards him. Looking at just that, Blitz Q seems to be the obvious winner, and in many cases it is. But, Thresh can recast his Q to dash to the champion if being over there is more convenient than them being over here. Not to mention he can bring one other person along for the ride. So in totality, Thresh Q is more conditional than Blitz Q, but the increased use cases combined with built-in guarantee value has it on par with Blitz Q at worst and stronger than Blitz Q at best for a net positive outcome. Although in fairness, Blitz Q can pull enemies over walls while Thresh Q cannot, but I think you get the point. If you want to add fluctuating effects to moves, they should on average be just as good as other abilities or should have more applicable use cases to incentivize a champion over the alternative. Renata does not. So you're essentially choosing to play a more inconsistent version of basically any other controller by playing her, with the only incentive backing her up being that she could potentially do more than other controllers. Realistically though, it's not by much. Let's say the range of effectiveness of a typical enchanter or a catcher is 80 to 120. Renata's is 50 to 150. It still averages out to 100, and Renata's upside's a lot higher, but so is her downside. For players to be comfortable accepting a wider variance, the average has to be worth the risk. In other words, Renata needs a range of 60 to 160 to round out at 110 for people to be willing to tolerate that extra 20% negative chance, if that makes sense. The thing is, she used to have that 60 to 160 variance, but then they hotfixed her in 12.4, then nerfed her in 12.9, then in 12.14, bringing her down to 50 to 150 or even 40 to 140, putting even more of an onus on the player to make up that difference for less reward. The question at that point is, why would anyone shoulder that burden when there are other more efficient options? A lot of this has to do with the notion that Renata is expressly meant for coordinated play. It's written all over her kit. Every single one of her abilities is 10 times more effective when you're in 5v5 with voice comms, since you rely just as much on your team being on the same page as you, as you rely on the enemy team being as stupid as possible. Naturally, she makes for a poor solo queue champion, as she's not very intuitive. Let's return to Bela for a moment. All Renata players have had this happen to them a dozen times. The enemy assassin dies on your AD carry, and you cast W on them, putting them into that zombie state. You then burn the rest of your abilities to lock the enemy champion down as best you can, only to find out your ADC is running away instead of growing a pair and fighting to keep their life. The thing is, in the spur of the moment, not many players are going to be like, okay, Renata's going to W me, so even if the enemy said dives my ass, I'm going to play like a total psychopath and fight. No, most AD carries' first instinct when a set's about to tear them a new one is to run like hell, and by the time they realize they had to kill something to stay alive, they already lost half their HP, by then it's too late. Loyalty program's another unintuitive ability. For it to be most effective, the AD carry has to be standing between you and the enemy. Normally, the support is the one who stands in front of the AD, or at least next to them, not stand behind them while they're staring down a pike and draven about to have them for breakfast without any milk. But that's how you have to stand positionally for Renata's E to both shield as many friendlies and damage as many baddies as possible. Basically, Renata's abilities crucially depend on her teammates knowing how she likes to play and the enemy team not knowing how she likes to play. That can make her feel really frustrating to use when you may have the right idea but the players you're trying to set up don't. I get that this concept applies to every support champion to an extent, but that's all the more reason why the value of a support has to be guaranteed. 
you're already dealing with fluctuating player IQs. Having to also deal with fluctuating results leads to a huge consistency nightmare, which is why Renata fell off so hard and so quickly. Anyways, that wraps up everything I wanted to say about the champion. Let me know what your thoughts are on Renata in the comments down below whether you agree or disagree with my points. But as always, if you enjoyed the video, it would be great if you left a like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Farsvarim, join my Discord server, and check out my other Why No One Place episodes if you haven't yet. Till next time though, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.